Now, jazz singer Mel Torme has done many things in his life and continues to be perhaps our most uh, successful jazz performer and singer. He tells a fascinating story about one of his early uh, performances in New York City, and as he was getting ready to sing, he looked out in the audience, and there was this large, rotund figure sitting with her back turned towards him. It almost uh, made him lose his confidence, and he tells us it was Sophie Tucker, who at that time was one of the famous ladies of song in New York City and cabarets. So it's interesting to hear Merrill Torme recount that story and his memories of the famous Sophie Tucker. I never had much use for Sophie Tucker. I don't like <laughs> big fat old ladies singing songs about sex. That bores the hell People out of me. People are throwing chairs at the set. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know if they can throw them or not, but I mean, I'm telling it as it is. Yeah. But it did disturb me professionally. There are artists in this business that I absolutely worship and I love to go see and I'm the first person on my feet. I stand up, I cheer. Uh, that's not to make a spectacle of myself because I really feel yeah. that I, I've appreciated their talent. But there are a lot of people in this business that I wouldn't walk around the corner to see. However, if I'm in an audience where that performer is, for, by hook, by crook, by some happenstance of fate, I will applaud as much as the next person. I will be professionally courteous as well as courteous as a human being. Sure. And I think that one of the things we lack in our society now, which is really sad, and I'm not going to proselytize about it, but I do feel it strongly, is a giant lack of manners. Oh. There's this new wo this oh, woman. Oh, you've hit my pet peeve. This woman has written a, a, a book now. I can't think of her name. She's written a big, fat book, apparently, on manners and, yes. and the regaining of it in our country. And apparently, it's a big bestseller. Dor Dorothy Manners, yeah. No, 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 no not Dorothy Manners. Well, I you mean, it's that silly kind of man. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy no. Mattis, I heard a great line last night. Every American has the inalienable right to be well-bred. Uh, lovely. It's pretty good. Well, I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. There's another, I must tell you, I don't know if I mentioned it in the profile, I can't remember. But I found a book several years ago, and I'd like to be able to say I discovered it. I did not. It was brought to my attention by Jo Stafford, who herself is a pursuer of excellence. And the book by John Gardner, who was the head of health education and welfare under, I think, Johnson. He started Johnson, Common Cause. Right, started the Common Cause, right. which I'm proudly a member. Right. Um, wrote a book called Excellence. Right. And what he says is very simply this. If you're a house painter, painting a house, and you attack your job with the same intensity, uh, the, the same standard and brand of concern as anybody else, and you do the job to the zenith of your ability, you are the equal of Pablo Picasso, another kind of painter. And I believe that. Sure. And I, the, the only people I really have respect for in this world, and I don't care if the guy's an auto mechanic who says, Mr. Torme, we've got your car in here. Now, we could do this, but I want to make it right. Boy, do I love that guy. Do I love and do I respect that guy. Yeah. There's too little of it in the world right now, and I hope it, I hope it changes. Yeah, indeed. You said an interesting thing here, uh, that Richard Rogers didn't like the way you sang his songs, which surprised me that he would be so presumptuous to think that he is the only one who could interpret his writings. Well, I'm a little empathetic toward the way he felt. Now, incidentally, this was the lyric, not even the melody, and he did not write the lyric. Yeah. Lorenz Hart wrote it. When I sang Blue Moon in Words and Music back in 1950 at MGM, he was on the stage when I recorded Blue Moon. I got to the second stanza of the song, and I sang, Blue Moon, you knew just what I was there for. You heard me saying a prayer for someone I read. He said, oh, hold it, hold it. <laughs> said, what? And everybody stopped. It was huge 80-piece oh orchestra. Yeah. He said, Mel, Mel, don't sing it like that. Sing it. You heard me saying a prayer for someone I really could care for. I said, Mr. Rogers, I, believe me, I worship you. But I don't think that's the right way to sing it. And I heard this little squirt telling Richard Rogers. You're 20-some years old. But I did believe in what I... I wasn't being temperamental or cocky. I, I did yeah. it very, very carefully and non-abrasively. Yeah. But I sing a lyric. As a matter of fact, 2020 is doing a piece on me right now. And one of the big things that they talked about was this Richard Rogers thing. And they talked about why I got into this small imbroglio with him. And I explained to him that I sing a lyric as I would say it. And I would never say, Blue Moon, you heard me saying a prayer for... Oh, someone I really could care for. I would say you heard me saying a prayer for someone I really could care for. That's the essence right. of, in my opinion, the intelligent reading of lyrics. You read a lyric, I mean, 
the best poetry by Emily Dickinson, I mean, I can go right down the list, Esna St. Vincent Millay, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, they write their poetry, and while everything rhymes perfectly, the phrases are split. It's a split phrase. Right. And you, you don't read the poetry sing song, I went to da 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 I went da 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 That's stupid. And I, I, I held my ground and I sang the song like that. And everybody seemed to like it except Richard Rogers. And then many years later, when they did a tribute to him on the David Frost show, they called me and asked me if I'd do it. I said, look, I'll fly there free. But Richard Rogers turned me down. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You never got over that. As a matter of fact, they did a funny thing. They said, we were so stunned that we then said, well, Mr. Rogers, what about Peggy Lee on this show? He said, no, no, it's wonderful, but no. Well, and then they said, we got silly. We said, what about Frank Sinatra? He said, no, no, no. Good singer. But no. He said, well, Mr. Rogers, who would you like? He pulled a list out of his pocket. He said, now, here's who I'd like. Ralph McIntyre, Betty O'Toole, John <laughs> Goldfarb. He read a list of people who had done his shows on the road. In other words, road show people, young right. people that nobody had ever heard of, right. but they sing, Blue Moon, you knew just what I was there for. You heard me sing a prayer for someone I really could care mm -hmm. for. And that's what he wanted. He didn't care for interpretation. He didn't care really much, I don't think, for heart. He wanted to hear his songs sung in precisely this, and I'm sorry to say it, what I call cookie cutter manner. And when you write a popular song, my feeling is that it is widely open to interpretation. Otherwise, there's no need for Peggy Lee or Jack Jones or Mel Torme or Ella Fitzgerald. What you do is you make a computerized robot record of it, and it's always done exactly the same. You are rather remarkable for a lot of reasons, but, but uh, you are unusual in that you are eclectic by your own uh, design, by your own designation uh, description. And yet you are very, very successful in one area. Now, most people who are eclectic are not really, as Jean Monnet once said, you must deny yourself the world to truly be successful mm. in life, which means you have to put away, you got to pick one thing and be great at it. And most great accomplished people are just that. Jackson Pollock probably was a terrible car driver. Uh, Pablo Picasso couldn't arrange money. I mean, you know, the list is endless. Mm -hmm. You're kind of an exception. Do you agree with that statement? I don't know if I excel really in any of these areas that I deal in, whether it's writing or newspaper movie. articles or books, or I've, I've written some television plays, you know, The Virginian and Run for Your Life and Mannix. Uh, I do them honestly because they nourish me. Now, this is not to denigrate singing, because some people say, what is he, putting singing down? Absolutely not. I love to sing. I love to perform. But singing the narrow genre of the popular song, Joe, has really never nourished me enough. And I swear to God, if somebody said, you can write all the books you want, we're never going to publish them. You can write all the songs you want, we're never going to publish them. You can write all the magazine articles and newspapers. We just, we're not, I'm telling you right now, you can write them. You might as well put them in the drawer. I'd write them. Okay. Because I'm, I'm impelled to write them. You know, Mel Torme has written a lot of songs, but I think we all love, particularly the one that's called the Christmas song, and it goes, Chestnuts roasting on an open fire, ya-da-da, never mind, <laughs> Mel Torme.